Hello, my name is Courtney and I am a fourth year Doctor of Pharmacy student at Drake University and a Master of Public Health student at Des Moines University. Today I will be providing you with a brief overview of the prescription antifungal medication voriconazole. Some topics I will be discussing include indications and dosing of voriconazole, adverse effects and monitoring, and common drug-drug interactions. I would like to note that the content of this presentation represents my own opinions, but is based on information from the references listed at the end of the presentation. Voriconazole is an azole antifungal. It falls in the triazole category along with fluconazole, posaconazole, and intraconazole, and it differs from the imidazole antifungals like ketoconazole, myconazole, and clotrimazole due to the presence of an extra nitrogen atom in the azole ring. Voriconazole's antifungal effect results from its selective inhibition of 14-alpha-linosterol demethylation. This prevents the synthesis of ergosterol, a key component in the structure of the fungal cell wall. There are currently five FDA-approved indications for voriconazole. Invasive aspergillosis originates from the aspergillus species, candidemia, esophageal candidiasis, and invasive candidiasis are infections of the candida species. Serious mycosis infections are also approved indications for voriconazole. Voriconazole acts in a time-dependent manner but is unique in the fact that it is fungicidal against invasive aspergillosis, but is fungistatic against the candida species. For this reason, it is a first-line therapy for invasive aspergillosis, but only an alternative therapy for candida infections. Invasive aspergillosis is an opportunistic infection from the aspergillus species mold that usually affects patients who are immunocompromised. The infection most commonly involves the respiratory tract and presents as sinusitis, pneumonia, or tracheobronchitis. Galactomannan may serve as a diagnostic biomarker as it is a carbohydrate component of the aspergillus species cell walls. It is important to perform the assay prior to initiation of antifungal therapy, as initiating antifungal therapy prior may result in a false negative. Additionally, concurrent or recent use of piperacillin tazobactam and amoxicillin has a potential for cross-reactivity, which in turn may result in a false positive galactomannan assay. A polymerase chain reaction test, or commonly known as a PCR test, may also be performed to rule out invasive aspergillosis in patients at high risk but it should not be used as a sole biomarker for diagnosis. According to a recent systematic review published in Clinical Microbiology and Infection, combination PCR and galactomannan screening may have greater diagnostic accuracy in high-risk patients. A diagnosis of aspergillus is treated with voriconazole and it requires a loading dose of six milligrams per kilogram by intravenous route every 12 hours for two hours. Following that, maintenance dosing is started and is typically weight-based as listed here. To note, this is the same dosing that is used for candidemia and invasive candidiasis. Duration of treatment should be at least 14 days, but is typically much longer in practice, even months. For adverse effects associated with voriconazole, severe hepatotoxicity is rare, but a mild to moderate elevation of liver enzyme levels may be just dose limiting, whereas visual disturbances, a prolonged QT interval, and nephrotoxicity may lead to discontinuation of voriconazole. Visual disturbances are luckily reversible with discontinuation. Concern for QT prolongation is more serious when a patient is concurrently taking other medications that also have potential to prolong the QT interval. Efficacy of voriconazole can be evaluated through improvement in symptoms, which, 
for invasive aspergillosis of the respiratory tract may include improved breathing and relief of chest pain or cough. Initial and repeat fungal and cultures can also demonstrate antifungal efficacy. Therapeutic drug monitoring of voriconazole is recommended by the Infectious Disease Society of America for invasive aspergillosis to improve response and to reduce toxicity. For an invasive aspergillosis infection that does not involve the central nervous system, the Infectious Diseases Society of America recommends a trough range of 1 to 1.5 micrograms per milliliter. CNS aspergillosis requires a higher trough range of 2 to 5 micrograms per milliliter. Serum creatinine and liver function tests should be measured at baseline for proper dosing and to ensure avoidance of hepatotoxicity. Visual side effects are more commonly seen in treatments lasting longer than 28 days, so at that point it would be appropriate to begin periodic assessment for any visual side effects. Voriconazole is both a substrate and an inhibitor of the hepatic enzymes CYP2C19 and CYP3A4, as well as a CYP2C9 substrate. So because of this, it often presents several drug-drug interactions as challenges for the managing clinician and pharmacist. Some common medications that interact with voriconazole include amiodarone, clopidogrel, fluoxetine, omeprazole, amlodipine, fentanyl, and others included in this table. Depending on the severity of the interaction and clinical judgment, medication doses may be adjusted to account for the interaction or temporarily discontinued during the treatment course of voriconazole. Contraindications to use with voriconazole include simvastatin, lovastatin, ziprazidone, lorazidone, sirolimus, carbamazepine, and rifampin. Voriconazole is available as a tablet, an oral solution, and an intravenous solution. Dose adjustment is not needed for renal impairment, but rather for hepatic impairment. It is only recommended for use in child Pew class A and B, in which the maintenance dose is halved. Use of voriconazole in child Pew class C is debatable and should be determined by the, by the provider that the benefits outweigh the risks. For impaired renal function with a creatinine clearance less than 50 milliliters per minute, the oral formulation is actually preferred, and this is to prevent accumulation of the IV vehicle. If oral voriconazole is used, it should be administered at least one hour before or one hour after a meal to maximize absorption and bioavailability. Lastly, it is important to know that voriconazole is considered a NIOSH Group 3 medication. This group is classified as non-antineoplastics that have reproductive risks. Precautions that should be followed when handling this medication are gloving and, depending on the type of administration, protective gowning and using closed system transfer devices. These precautions are especially important for women of childbearing potential as the hazardous nature of the medication may cause infertility. Listed on this slide are the references used to create this presentation. Thank you for watching and I hope this presentation was beneficial to your knowledge on the use of voriconazole in practice.